Hi everybody, it's Marla Gold from Dog Care on Air, and I'm here with Sagar Gandalia, and he's gonna to talk to us about dog photography. He'll take us on a journey of how to understand how to take the best photos of your dog, from what kinds of lenses he uses to how to set up a great shot. There are challenges to taking dog quali quality uh, photos with your dog, and the rewards of capturing memories of your loving fur buddy are well worth the effort. This is Sagar Gandalia, Sagar Gandalia and Vu, his dog. Um, he's a self-taught professional dog photographer. He prepared for his vocation with a bachelor's in, in English, a tour in the Peace Corps in Serbia, years on the business side of healthcare, and working as a rock climbing guide in Wyoming. And he has pet several dogs. So what well, a more than a few. <laughs> more than a few, I'm sure. <laughs> so I want to welcome you, Sagar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and get to talk a little bit about what I love to do. Fantastic. Well, let's begin. What are we going to be talking about? Yeah, so I thought I would uh, kind of break this up into uh, a number of, of categories. So, you know, we'll talk about each of these things. Um, and more importantly, uh, we'll, we'll have some images that help support and, and explain the, the principles that we're talking about. So start off and talk a little bit about gear and equipment and uh, you know, some cost effective or more expensive ways that you can, you can approach that. And then we'll move into the more important stuff, which is how to actually take the great dog photos because really at the end of the day, the camera is just the tool and, uh, and knowing your subject and, and figuring out how to take these wonderful photos is, is much more about technique and experience than it is about having the right equipment. Absolutely. So let's, let's find out how did you get started in dog photography? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, it's kind of a, a strange question. Um, how do you end up a dog photographer? Uh, I um, used to have a real job. Um, it really didn't suit me very well. Uh, I was uh, working on the business side of healthcare for a number of years um, and kind of just wasn't finding a lot of reward in the work. And so I uh, kind of took a, a leave of absence. I moved into my car, as you can see here with my dog, Vu, and we just spent two years rock climbing. Uh, around mostly the western US. Um, the beginning of the trip, I got super lucky. I drew a Grand Canyon permit, and with some of my best friends, I got to spend three weeks rafting down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon and figured I should probably buy a camera to uh, document such a cool trip. And uh, over the course of those couple years, um, I thought about doing a lot of things. I had a bachelor's degree in English and always wanted to write, so I wrote a book. Um, I've been a rock climber my whole life, so I became a rock climbing guide. I was just trying to say yes to opportunity to try and figure out what the next path forward was. And throughout the whole time I was taking photos and really learning a lot about photography and just loving the whole process and realized it kind of snuck up on me that photography is the thing I should do. Uh, so like most people, I looked into ski photography or climbing photography because that's what I did. Or uh, I started shooting some weddings and interning for wedding photographers. And I found that I don't really like weddings that much. <laughs> uh, but this whole time I was couch surfing a lot, spending time with friends and they had dogs. And so I was taking a lot of pictures of people's dogs and they, the response was overwhelming. People were really excited about their dog photos. And that's when I kind of had the light bulb moment that, you know, I'm in my early thirties and I've got all these friends who are married and 20 years ago, everybody is 30 and married and has two kids. And so they pay a professional photographer to put pictures of those kids on the wall. And now I'm in my early 30s and all my friends are married and we all have two dogs, but nobody is paying any professional photographers to put pictures of the dogs on the wall. So that's the, the niche that I've been trying to fill ever since. That, that sounds so right. I think anybody who owns a dog who's listening in would be nodding their head going, yes, if they, yes. If they don't already have a portrait of their dog or, or a, you know, a photo of their dog somewhere in their home, they're like, yeah, I'm getting one. <laughs> <laughs> But this is so actually I'm really I'm really excited for everybody to see, you know, from the perspective of, of a more of a professional photographer, how to take these quality photos. And um, so why don't we start by like you walking us through the basics of starting out, like how you know, what would you recommend somebody buy in their startup kit as a photographer? Oh uh, yeah. Excuse me. Um so there's an old anecdote in photography that is spoken over and over and over again, and I really believe it to be true. And the question is, what is the best camera in the world? Do you know the answer? 
No, I don't know. It's the one in your hands, right? It's the one you have with you. Uh, if you don't have the camera, then you're never going to take the photo. So it doesn't really matter what the camera is as long as you have the means to capture the moments and the places and times that you're there. So when I started out in photography, I brought my camera everywhere. It went literally everywhere with me so that I would never miss an opportunity to, to try and take a cooler photo. But for most people, that means that they always have their phone with them. And the cameras on phones these days are out of control. They're outrageously good. And so if you understand the principles of basic photography, how to capture great light and, and know the behavior of your dog and you spend more time with your dog than anyone, then it's really easy to take great photos with your phone. And so my number one recommendation to people that are starting out in photography is take your phone with you everywhere, treat it like a camera and start taking pictures every day. And if you find yourself a month in enjoying the process of taking photos with your phone all the time, then it's probably worthwhile for you to go out and, and think about a real camera. Um, and, and if you're going to go that route, I'm a big fan of recommending any camera with interchangeable lenses. Um, the best bang for your buck in photography is always on the lens, not the camera. You can buy a, a less expensive camera body and a more expensive lens, and you're going to get a much better product as a result. Um, and there's a, you know, I don't want to bore folks with, with the technical approach, but, uh, the camera market has shifted considerably in the last few years, moving from what were called DSLRs uh, to mirrorless cameras. I'm sure you've probably heard that term a time or two before, but the way that old cameras work all the way back from the film days is that you look through the viewfinder and a mirror bounces the light down and out through the lens. So you see what the lens sees. And then when you take a picture, that mirror flips up and exposes the film behind it with a shutter and then closes it and then the mirror flips back down and you see again what the lens does. And so as digital technology progressed, the same thing happened where you see what the lens sees, the lens flips up, exposes now a digital sensor instead of old film and then closes. So that's what DSLR technology was. And in the last few years, particularly in the last like two or three, mirrorless technology has been blowing up and that's basically a removal of the, um, the mirror. So now the lens shoots directly to a sensor and then that sensor is digitally reproduced either in your viewfinder or on the back of your camera. So you're seeing exactly what the sensor sees at all times, which is a really cool, it's a really cool technology because there's no guessing on your exposure. You literally see on the screen the photo you're going to take, which really helps simplify the more complex nuances of balancing aperture and, and ISO and shutter speed. So a mirrorless camera is what I would recommend for folks. Um, Sony, Olympus, Panasonic all make really great high quality mirrorless cameras that are pretty affordable. You can get into them for between 400, 500 bucks on the lower end and all the way up to, you know, two, 3000 bucks if you want to go crazy. The other component is a lot of these cameras come with what's called a kit lens. And I'm not a big fan of these. They're pretty cheap. Um, they can get the job done, but if you have the option to just buy the body, uh, I really recommend uh, what are called prime lenses. And those are lenses that don't have a zoom functionality. Uh, you get, much higher quality photos, you get a brighter f-stop or aperture, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, and the effects of why that's cool. And then the most important thing is because you can't zoom, it forces you to use your legs as your zoom, and that makes you a better photographer. Like, you tell somebody to take a picture of something, and the first thing they do with their zoom lens is they stop, and they zoom in on that thing, right? But that's not very interesting, because I also just saw the same thing from the same spot you were in. But if you have a fixed focal length, now you, maybe you're going to duck down or you're going to try and get to a higher spot or you're going to move around and find a cool frame to, to position your subject in. So just having that fixed focal length uh, really forces you to explore photography a little bit more as, a, as a, a beginner. So yeah, I guess the short answer to a long question is start with your phone and then move on to uh, something inexpensive with your camera and maybe a little bit higher quality lens. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what lenses in, uh, in particular as we move on to, to lenses, which I think is next. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's encouraging is to, to me to hear from what you're saying is that starting with your phone, it, it, you, can, you can just practice, you know, getting in and we're, you're going to take us through like all the different ways you can, you can take a picture, but um, how easy actually it is to begin, right? So you're really encouraging. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> All right, let's let's look at uh, lenses. Cool. So these are a whole bunch of numbers, um, probably overwhelming to some people, and some people are probably super into the the technical aspects. 
So I'll, I'll kind of talk about it pretty briefly, but the way we measure lenses or describe lenses is called their focal length. And the focal length, not to get too technical, but it's the distance at which the, the lens is resolving an image back to the sensor. So, you know, in general, the shorter the lens, the wider your field of view. So you're going to be able to see more things. And the longer the number, the longer the millimeter number, the more telephoto and narrow and zoomed in, as most people probably think of it, your, your photo is going to be. So these lenses basically range from extremely wide angle to extremely telephoto, where I have a lot of zoom or a lot of reach. And the second numbers on the far right hand side are, uh, are, are what's called your f-stop or your aperture. It's one of the three key components of photography. And there's a little hole in the back of your lens and you can open and close that, limiting or allowing more light into the, the final image. And so the smaller that number, the bigger the hole. So f2.8 is a pretty, pretty big hole. f1.2, as you see down lower, is an extremely wide hole. And then as all of these lenses also allow you to narrow that hole down all the way usually to somewhere in the f22 range and uh and we'll talk about in a little bit the effects of that but that's just what all these numbers mean um i think as we go through i have some image examples of each of these that uh that'll hopefully illustrate the the principles a little bit better okay let's have a look at them cool the first one is a super weird lens it's called a fisheye lens uh, and basically what's happening here is you are compressing more than the normal field of view that you can see. This is like almost 180 degrees from left to right. And because there's so much information and we're trying to cram it into a rectangle, you're gonna get distortion. So that's why all, there's all these bowed lines on the outside. Um, and if you can believe it in this photo, I am maybe six inches from, from this dog eating food. Um, and usually these lenses are not very popular. People use them for astrophotography or um, really commonly for landscapes, that kind of thing. But dogs are unique. They, they don't need to look pretty or normal. You know, if I took this photo of you or of me, we would be extremely distorted and particularly unflattering. It wouldn't be a good portrait lens. But with dogs, like, look at how goofy this dog looks, right? You, you can tell so much of a story. There's so much context going on. So I guess the, the, the principle here is just that there are no rules when, when taking photos of dogs. They don't have to look pretty. Um, and a really cool corollary to this lens, and then we'll go to the next one now, um, is that these wide angle lenses uh, are actually really accessible. Um, the newest iPhone actually has a third lens on it now that is this extreme wide angle that's actually seeing a larger field of view than a normal human would. So it really opens up your, your abilities and what you can do. So this, these two images I'm hoping illustrate that you can get very close with a wide angle lens and you can stay very far with a wide angle lens and you can tell completely different stories. Like just because the lens is extremely wide doesn't mean that you're fixed in one style of photography. So I'm, I'm hoping to illustrate that with, uh, with a number of these. So these are, these are taken with what's called a rectilinear uh, wide angle. So there is no distortion. As you can see, the, the wide... Um, the lines aren't bowed on the outside. So your field of view is not quite 180 degrees. I think it's probably closer to 135 or so uh, in these photos. And I think that's actually relatively similar to what the iPhone wide angle lens that just came out is. Uh, and for the folks who just have um, like Android smartphones or uh, have an older generation of iPhone that don't have that wide angle lens, there's a number of companies that make really inexpensive lens attachments, which are actually really high quality and fantastic. You can get extra zoom out of your iPhone lens. You can, you can actually get a wider field of view through reverse magnification. I don't even know how the technology works, but it's really cool. And they're, they're really, really affordable. They usually come with like some sort of snap phone case and then you screw the lens on and it sits right over your normal camera lens and you get really cool new perspectives. It also makes it really easy to, to travel with. It's, it's quite light. You're, you just have your phone, I mean, your phone's multi-use. And then yep. if you're just adding an attachment because you have an older version, that's, you know, something you can easily store in a pocket, right? It's Yeah, it goes back to that, that anecdote about what's the best camera in the world. My dad uh, is an, uh, a hobbyist photographer and has a lot of really expensive and nice camera equipment. And more often than not, he'll go on trips and like, he doesn't want to haul this giant camera with him. And he ends up taking more photos with his phone and he has those little fun lens attachments. And you know, those are the memories that he, he gets to keep because he had the camera with him. Nice. Cool. Yeah, we can move on to the next one. 
So this is a, a standard lens. Um, the reason we call it a standard lens, it's actually a really popular focal length for uh, street photography. Um, but the reason we call it a standard lens is it's roughly the same way that humans see the world. It's that similar perspective and field of view to how we naturally see the world. So it's easy to generate images that people relate to because they're gonna usually reflect um, what we see in the world. And, and it's a great lens because as you can see here, I can get very close and do a nice tight portrait. And at the same time, I can come back a little bit and get a lot more context and, and it's a wide enough lens that I can, I can see what's going on. And, and because again, this is a, a really common focal length, um, lenses in this caliber tend to be pretty inexpensive and um, they're easy to use because we're familiar with how the world looks from our own perspective. So it's easy to replicate that with this, this length. And this is, I guess, what you could think of as your standard iPhone uh, lens as well. That middle, that middle one looks a lot like this. Nice. The next one we'll talk about are uh, a portrait lens. So this is generally anything longer than 50 millimeters. Um, most common portrait lenses, and this is interesting, are in the 85 to 100 millimeter length. Um, the reason we like these lenses is because they, they really uh, compress the background, uh, separate your subject out from the background. As you can see in both of these, I'm shooting with a very wide aperture and uh, a pretty long focal length. And so what's happening is the background is just completely blurry and, and super swirly and it's called bokeh, B-O-K-E-H is the effect. Um, and generally people call this a portrait length because they use it for people. And so there's a nice working distance. Like if you are too far from your, your model or your subject, you're not able to engage with them and elicit some human emotion or some response. And if you're too close, obviously, it's really uncomfortable. And so generally this is called a portrait length because it works really well for photographing people, but it also works really well for, for photographing dogs. And I found there is no comfortable distance to work with dogs. Some dogs, puppies in particular, always wanna be right next to you. And some dogs it's easier to work with when they're really far away. Maybe they have some aggression issues or, or you know, they, they come from uh, an unfamiliar environment, you know. And so there is, you know, I, I say a portrait length here, um, but it's just easy to remember every length is a portrait length with dogs. Um, this is just what the lenses are typically called in the industry. And this is probably my, my number one used lens. Uh, this is where most of my work happens is at about this distance, which is in both of these photos, I'm probably maybe like five feet from the dogs, maybe four or five feet from the dogs. Do you do a lot of your photos outdoors? I do as much as I can outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all about the dog, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I come to houses and, and meet a dog who's super old and not really excited about getting outside. And so we do all of our work inside because that's where the dog is most comfortable. My, my one thing that I don't like doing is studio style dog photos. There are a ton of people who do really great studio dog photos. Um, for me, they don't look like dogs. They're, you know, they're not out in their environment. They're not doing their thing. Um, the dog photos that I love most and cherish and try and recreate are the ones that you resonate with, that you've seen your dog in that position how many thousand times. And those are the memories I'm trying to, to capture and recreate. Beautiful. These are beautiful shots. Thanks. They're fun. These are such fun dogs. <laughs> We have some more lenses to explore. Yeah, lots more lenses. Um, macro generally means uh, very close to your subject. Um, and I know that's counterintuitive because you think of macro as big, but it's just, just what the industry calls it. Uh, as you can see in both these photos, I am extremely close. And these are really non-traditional photos. Again, if I took a, a photo this close of your nose, I don't think you would be very excited about it. But dogs, you know, paws, texture, they just, there's so much about a dog that, that isn't its face or isn't it running. You know, we spend so much time in very close proximity with our dogs. So photos like this make me really happy. Um, and they're also really accessible with the iPhone. There are macro attachments for your, your phone as well, where you can get really close to your subjects. The key thing with macro photography is the closer you get, the shallower your depth of field gets. And so it becomes difficult to get a lot in focus. And so the way you can compensate with that is by getting a lot of light. So it really helps to be shooting these style photos with your phone or with a real camera outside, um, just because you want to get as much light as you can. Otherwise, the, the photos are going to be extremely shallow in their depth of field and nothing will be in focus. So this is such a creative shot, the one with the eye, reflection in the eye. Thank you. 
Yeah, <laughs> love it. And then finally, we've got telephoto, and these are like what people think of as super zoom. You know, um, they're great because they they even more uh, are able to separate the background from the subject. Uh, the reason that you don't shoot a lot of human portraits with these lenses, is like I was mentioning earlier, you're super far away. So you can imagine on this photo on the left, these dogs are hauling directly at me at 25 miles an hour. So I have to be extremely far away so that I can get out of the way by the time they get to where I am. Um, but these, these are a little bit harder lenses or things to replicate with the phone. Mm -hmm. um, the telephoto lenses that exist for the phone, they're pretty good. Uh, but in general, when you're shooting telephoto, I find that I'm shooting a lot of action. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is one of the limitations of, of shooting with uh, lower grade equipment or with phones is that capturing dogs in motion or capturing action photos um, are, are quite a bit more difficult for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about shooting dogs in action. But as you can see in both of these, um, these, are, these are some of my favorite photos to take. They're, they're actually surprisingly easy if you can believe that. And I'll, I'll talk about, even with extremely low-end consumer equip, consumer grade equipment, how you can capture photos just like this in just a second. Cool, I think that takes us through all of the, uh, the lenses. Um, and we're almost done with the boring technical equipment stuff. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about really quickly, these are the cameras that I shoot with. Um, the first one is between $1,500 and $2,000. And the second one is somewhere between $500 and 1000 um, there are versions of these same, same cameras that, uh, exist right now. You can pick up for two, 300 bucks, uh, older models that, that still do a fantastic job. And, and the differences between them, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day about photography and the reality is if you're going to buy anything on the, the market, that's a medium level, uh, camera, it is pretty much overkill. Like the differences that people talk about between this camera and that camera, like, almost all of them are better than what we need. You know, they're, they're just incredible, incredible devices. And the, the technology baked into these things at this point is light years beyond what we need. So buy a Nikon, buy a, buy a Canon, buy an Olympus, Panasonic, Sony, Pentax, they all make great cameras. Even if you're not spending a lot of money, it's still probably more than what you need. So this next photo is a really special photo for me. Uh, this is probably the photo that made me think that I could do what I do now. Uh, this is a friend's dog in Helena, Montana years ago, shot with my first camera, which is not a very expensive camera, shot with a, a pretty nice lens, um, but the camera really struggles with continuous autofocus, which means keeping the thing in focus as it moves. Um, that's, that's one of the things that you pay for in a, in a nicer, nicer camera body. And so this is actually not shot with continuous autofocus. Uh, as was most of my first year of work. It was shot in manual focus, and I just repeated the photo over and over again. What I did here is I have the dog's owner out of the frame, you know, a little bit past where you can see, holding onto the dog, and I know the dog likes to chase balls. So I'm set up. I've got my shot all set up. I've got the light behind me, as you can see, so the light is shining down on the dog. I've set up my whole scenario, and then there's a stick just out of frame on the left and I dial my manual focus into that stick, and then I have my friend throw the ball at me. It's even better if they hit me, because then the dog's coming straight at me. And then as the dog approaches the stick, I just hold down the shutter button, and I've got it set to rapid fire. And I'll take 10 or 15 or 20 photos as the dog runs through the focal plane, and then we just repeated it. I think we repeated it four times, and eventually came away with this photo, which is razor sharp, in perfect focus, dog has no points on the ground. I think she's going like 30 miles an hour. Wow. And, and you know, you don't have to have really great equipment to make photo, photos like this. That's amazing. I, you know, just like you say, the best camera is the camera in your hand. And, and so, like, well, the next part of what you're going to be speaking about is going to be how we do this and what kinds of, you know, perspectives. And you're going to go through a whole list of things. But... That is amazing that, so when you, were, were you taught to do that? Were you taught to set up the shot that way? No, or I just kind of how... made it up, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Yeah, it, uh, it, it seemed like a fun thing to try, and uh, I tried it several times, and it worked really well. And, and then for the next year, when I started shooting professionally, I didn't have camera equipment that could do better than this. So I would set up the same experiment with, with other owners and like, 
does the dog come better than does it fetch? It doesn't want sticks or frisbees or balls. And, and it's just recreating that same scenario over and over again. Uh, a key thing to think about in this photo, for example, is positioning yourself with light. So if I were to be on the other side and having the dog running at me in that direction, then the light is, is behind the dog. And so it's backlighting it. The dog's face is in shadow. Um, a lot of people always talk about how taking photos of a black dog or a dark dog is extremely difficult. And there's simple and easy ways to, to, to compensate for that. And the first and most important one is get some good light on the dog. Mm -hmm. Just because it's black doesn't mean that you're not going to get a lot of contour and, and you know, different like sheens off the fur that, that allow it to, to pop in its background. Love it. So yeah, we talked about this is a low grade camera that I took this photo with. And if we go to the next slide, this is a camera that cost me almost $2,000 more than the one before. Are these better photos than the other photos? They might actually be worse, right? Like, so it really, it, it just goes to show that um, it isn't the equipment. It's, it's knowing your subject and, and putting yourself in the right position to be able to take these kinds of photos. You see a, a lot of sled dog photos in my, my presentation. I live in Alaska. Uh, it's the state sport really popular and, and a super fun thing to shoot. But the, the reason I like shooting it the most is because it's extremely predictable. Mm -hmm. There is a track and you know where the dogs are going to be. So even if I'm not shooting continuous autofocus, I can do that trick of shooting manual autofocus and just shoot through the frame as they're coming through because I know where they're going to, I know where they're coming from, I know where they're going to. And it's just really easy to, to recreate that. So, um, you know, it's all about, like I was saying earlier, predictable predictable behavior, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. So this is kind of the, the section we're done with the equipment. Now we can start talking a little bit about how to, to take these great photos. And the number one suggestion I have to people is to get low. Um, how many photos do we have of our dog where we're standing there with our phone and we look down at the dog and we take the picture? Mm -hmm. And that's how we see our dogs every day, but it's not how the dogs see the world. So getting low um, eye level or you know, even below eye level sometimes can get us some really cool perspectives. So I've got a couple examples here um, that, are, that are pretty cool. Uh, the first one is shot from eye level. It's not a bad photograph, but or excuse, from human's eye level. Mm -hmm. And then the second photo, I got super low. I'm, my camera is almost on the ground here and I'm shooting up at the dog. And you know, these are both, they're both nice photos of the dog, but I think that the right one is much more compelling to me because that is a perspective I don't usually see uh, the dog from in my day-to-day -day life. And uh, another, another example of that in the next slide is the exact same principle. Like here's Rambo from directly down as a human would see Rambo. And then here's Rambo where I get super low. And again, they're both, they're both nice photos, but I'm much more drawn to the one on the right mm -hmm. because you know, that's, that's a, the way the dog sees the world. <laughs> so cute. It's yeah, and then, uh, you know, perspective is everything. This, this next slide kind of speaks to that as well. Like, how low can you get to the dog, right? Yeah. Like, this is what the dog sees all day while it's sleeping. It sees your dirty floors. <laughs> so, so really thinking about perspective and, and changing the way that you, you take photos of dogs is, is pretty key. Um, and then the next thing that I'll talk about while we're still on this slide is light. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need fancy flashes. Um, to, to take great dog photos. I rarely use flash when I'm taking my photos. So this is great because I'll ask you, where do you think the light is coming from? It looks like the right hand side of the Yeah. And what do you think the light source is? A window. Exactly. Nailed it on both counts. The windows are every dog photographer's best friend. A really fun trick that I'm going to recommend everybody do that's utterly unrelated to dog photography is go take a selfie and put your phone in a window and then look at the window and take the selfie and then turn around and do it again. And you're going to find that the one where you're looking at the window looks amazing. And the one where you didn't, you're backlit and you're going to look terrible. It's going to be washed out. The light isn't going to be very good. You're not going to pop off the background at all. And it's the exact same principle with dogs. If you can position a dog so that your back is to a window and you are facing the dog and, and taking those pictures, you're going to have such great light. Uh, the window, the window light in particular is great because it's slightly directed and it's usually diffuse. So you're not getting the sun coming straight through the window. You're looking for the sun being an amazing light source outside and all that light is reflecting and bouncing and then directed through this, this window into your house. 
Um, and it's just going to create nice, natural, soft, even light. You can, you can see that in this dog as well. Um, there's little, little bits of bright in, in the dog's eyes. And those are called catch lights. They really help um, people or dogs' uh, eyes to pop. If you don't have those catch lights, the eyes kind of look dead and it's a, a little bit unnerving of a photo. And so windows provide great catch lights because they are that kind of concentrated light source against uh, a blank wall. So, um, yeah, an interesting perspective that many people wouldn't even consider, right, when you're looking to set up a shot. But yeah. if you can take the time to do it, this is the way to use natural light. Okay, let's see some more. Some more. Yeah, so I think the next thing we'll talk about is composition. Um, you know, photography has a lot of compositional rules. We've got um, uh, they're written here, but the rule of thirds is kind of the big one. Um, I'm going to talk about each of these rules, but then I want to I want to remind folks like rules are meant to be broken. Um, learning photography, you should definitely stick to the rules. You should think about these rules and try and and try and fit them. And as you start to be comfortable with the rules, you'll start to learn why it's okay to break them and when it feels right, and and you'll be breaking them for a reason, you know. And and it, the the reason for breaking those rules will will help enrich your photo than if you'd followed them. So let's let's talk about a little bit what that looks like right now. The rule of thirds is super simple. It says don't put your subject in the middle of the shot. Um, you want to lay out uh, your your photo into a grid of thirds horizontally and thirds vertically, and in general where those lines intersect. So there's four points where they intersect on the left third, the right third, and the top third, and the bottom third, uh, where you want to position your subjects. So uh, in this first photo, you'll see that the eyes are right around that top vertical third and then i'm framing the whole thing with those bars which create a left and a right third mm -hmm. uh and and the fact that we have not a lot going on in that bottom third doesn't really matter because i followed so many of the other rules on the right hand photo for example if i'd put these dogs dead center in the photo you wouldn't you wouldn't be as drawn to the photo there's a number of things going on here i've got two levels of thirds uh in the horizon of the trees and then the point in which the snow meets the the tree line and then i've got the guy and the dogs on the left hand third running towards the right with a lot of empty breathing space for them to run into. So your, your eye kind of tells the story of these dogs and what direction they're traveling without actually having to see any motion, you know, I've captured the motion and frozen it, but you know that they're running, you know where they're running to. So these are, these are good examples of, of rule of thirds. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is a breathing room, which is kind of what I was just talking about. Again, if I were to center these dogs, um, they they wouldn't have room to run. It's it's really common with portraits too. You'll see a portrait of a person, and they'll be slightly tilted and looking one way or looking the other way, and there'll be a lot of negative space in the frame, and that allows a person to kind of breathe and, and like fill that frame with their direction. And so similarly with dogs, as they're running in one direction or the other, I try not to keep the dog in the center of the frame. I try and keep them. You know, and, and let's think, I didn't, I didn't show any examples of this, but let's think about the opposite, where in this first photo, you have this German Shepherd and it's running to the right, right? Um, if I were to have put him on the right third and had negative space on the left-hand side, the photo would feel extremely off balance. It would, uh, it would be weird, the, the dog would feel, it would be claustrophobic to look at the dog and have no room for him to run to the right and then all this negative space on the left. Mm -hmm. So likewise, on the, the right shot, I know that the dog is moving left in the frame, so I'm keeping the dog kind of on the right-hand side, and I've got more negative space on the left than the right. And this, this same principle applies to non-action photos. I probably should have put a couple dog portraits in here, but um, the, the dog also should, if it's looking left, you should have some negative space left or looking right, vice versa. This is interesting. I, I use this principle when I'm setting up my PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> as, as you can see right now. <laughs> also, like the way you framed yourself, you know, you're on one third of the, the shot and your, your head is tilted slightly towards the negative space. Right. And then I guess, so, so also usually, um, you know, so you're following the direction of the movement. The negative space is, is, is the area in which they're moving towards. And yeah, I, I love what you've done here. These are really great recommendations. All right. What's next? Fill the frame. Uh, filling the frame. So, uh, you know, getting close to your subject is, is super key. Uh, sometimes extremely, extremely close in this case where I've got the dog actually pawing my lens. I think I've got a treat uh, on top of my lens. I'm holding it and, and the dog is like trying to 
to do the the shake command and um and as a result like hits the camera and here's the second shot where i can't even see the dog's face and the paw is not in focus and yet i think it's a wonderful photo i think it's super fun and i wouldn't have gotten it if i hadn't got all up in this dog's business you know yeah uh, and then there's uh there's a rule where you're not supposed to cut off limbs well here i am both not cutting off dog limbs and breaking the rule and cutting off human limbs right uh, let's think about if I had taken this photo and captured the person running and the puppies running with them, right? I'm going to have a whole bunch of negative space up above and I'm not going to have filled the frame, right? This photo wouldn't tell the same story. I don't need to see the, the human to know what's going on here, right? The subject is the puppy. So it's fine that I cut off most of the human because I have got the boots and I know that I've got a guy running with his dogs. Absolutely. If you would cut off, off the puppy's feet, that would be a different story. It would be a different. That's that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's let's imagine if we cut off the puppy feet, and now you know there's no context for for what's going on. Um, it's just going to be a really awkward looking photo if we if we cut off the puppy feet or the puppy heads for that matter, and you just have a bunch of running paws. And then I wouldn't know they're puppies. Right. Love it. So here's a, a number of rules that we've broken. We talked about not. Uh, not cutting off limbs, but here I am cutting off half of a dog. Uh, or in this case, you know, I'm cutting out most of the human and most of the dogs. Uh, but in both cases, I'm, I'm able to break these rules because of the story I'm trying to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first photo, I'm, I'm getting low, giving some dog perspective on the world and, and showing where the dog is in the, in the kitchen. You know, I can see some stools in the background. And on the other hand, I don't need to see this guy's face. I just need to smile. I don't need to see these dogs' lower limbs. I just need their eyes to tell the story of this guy that loves his dogs and squishes them together. And one of them seems pretty cool with it and one of them not so much. <laughs> uh, here's another one where I cut off her head. I just kept her smile, you know? Yeah. And actually the, the original photo uh, that I took here does have her entirely in the frame and I intentionally chose to crop and keep her eyes out of it and just have that, that smile, that that's blurry out of focus smile because that's, that's the story, you know? She's almost embarrassed at how ridiculous her dog is in this photo. And then I don't need her, her whole head to tell that story. No, the focus is all on the dog, the crazy dog. And uh, it's lovely. Uh, and then we talked about filling the frame. Here I am breaking the rule of filling the frame. Uh, you know, I could, I could get closer to this dog, but um, it doesn't tell quite the same story. Like this, this photo tells me that I'm shooting in a snowstorm, you know? Like there is nothing else visible but this dog to me. And uh, the, the minimalism of it, uh, I think, is really fun and, and tells the, the story of what, what conditions were like when we were out shooting that day. Was it whiteout? Like Complete whiteout. Yeah, we, uh, so I was, I was shooting uh, at their house uh, at the, the base of some mountains in Alaska in a town called Palmer. And then we had plans to go up and they're big cross-country skiers, so they wanted to get some photos of themselves cross-country skiing with the dog. And as we drove up the mountain, it went from being a beautiful day to a complete snowstorm. And we got there and they pull up next to me and they're like, ah, bummer, I guess we're not taking photos today. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is amazing. We got so many really fun photos from that photo shoot. And uh, those are the photos they ended up buying and printing and putting on their wall. They're not the ones from the house. Fantastic. So you never know what situation you're gonna get yourself involved in and having that attitude of, oh, let's just take this on and see what happens. Let's. Yeah. let's Let's celebrate the, the white I mean, outfit. Let's, let's be real. Like, the yeah. dog is always going to be having a good time. So if you're not able to capture that, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so framing is a super fun um, compositional principle. You know, a, a photo of a, just a photo of something um, is usually going to be more interesting if you have that subject in context, whether that's a literally a frame, like we have pictures at home and we put them in frames and then they look nicer because it helps to center our eye. Well, likewise in photography, we can use all kinds of things to frame things. So here's a, a bunch of really weird examples of frames. On the left, I'm using, uh, this isn't intentional. I didn't intentionally ask her to part her hair like that, but her hair is framing her dog's eye as she leans down and gives him some love. On the right hand side, I do this a lot. This is shot through a fence. So I'm on one side of the fence and I've got some treats and I'm, I'm luring a dog to come and look at me and I'm able to use this, this fence to frame the dog's face and, and just show a little bit of, of the dog's face. 
Uh, the next two are also like pretty weird. Uh, on that left hand one, I'm using her and the frisbee to frame the dog in the center. So it doesn't even have to necessarily be a static thing, right? I've got objects in motion here, but I'm, I'm intentionally sandwiching them so that I've got the dog in the center of those things. On the right hand side, this is a dog playing with his, his other dog buddy. And I'm like down underneath the dog while they're playing, just rapid fire taking photos using the other dog's limbs to try and help frame the, the playing that's going on here. And then lastly, this is we get really meta. I'm using this dog's legs to frame its own legs. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a very uh, strange shot, but one that I, I really love and, uh, and was entirely just happenstance. Dog was in this position, has these really long, gangly limbs that I was trying to capture. And I don't need the dog's body to tell the story of how weird this dog looks. <laughs> I think from now on, I'm looking at, you know, taking pictures of dogs from a very different perspective because I mean, now that I know what I know, <laughs> I can't go back. Like I'll be, I'll, you know, even just taking a photo of anybody, you can use these principles. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the great thing about dogs is the photos don't have to be pretty. You know, this isn't an aesthetically appealing photo that we're looking at right now but there is something appealing about it, you know? Absolutely. Okay, but there's also the next stage, which is... Behavior. behavior. So this, is, this is probably the most important part for me and actually a little bit easier for folks at home. Um, it was a weird transition for me to go from taking photos of my dogs or taking photos of friends' dogs where I'm on their couch for a few days and hanging with the dog to showing up and in 60 minutes expected to deliver 50 to 75 fantastic images because I don't know that dog. So for you guys at home, you, you all know your dogs better than anyone. And so knowing their behavior is the easiest part. For me, I'll show up and usually what I do is I bring the cameras out. I don't turn them on and get the dogs used to them. Dogs are very excited to meet me. And then I just kind of follow the dog around, watch, I mean, your dogs are all wonderful, but let's be honest, they do like five things, right? <laughs> they sleep on the couch, they sleep over by that door, they get excited when the doorbell goes off. But, you know, I don't know what those triggers are, and I have to learn them every time I go to a new dog. You know what those triggers are, so you can set up and you can put yourself in positions in advance of your dog being in those positions to take advantage of those photos. You know, how often is your dog ridiculously cute? And so you go to get your phone, and that motion causes your dog to freak out and you lose the photo, right? Yeah. But you know your dog is going to do that again. And you know where your dog is going to do that and what time of day your dog is going to do that. So you just sit and wait for it to happen. Have the camera, have the phone out, be patient, um, and combine the, the ideas that we were talking about about perspective and putting yourself in position with good light and then predict some dog behavior that's going to happen and, and sit there and wait for it. And that applies to both portraits and, and static shots as much as it applies to uh, action shots. So if we go into the, uh, the next slides, I'm going to talk about a little bit how I do uh, action work. Um, I always ask owners, like, does your, ball, does your dog like to fetch? Are they better at chasing the ball or retrieving the ball? Will they come on command? Because all of these things will elicit predictable behavior. So in this case, this dog, not so good at bringing the ball back, right? Runs after the ball, grabs the ball, takes off. So we just have her throw the ball at me. And actually, in this case, uh, she did hit me a number of times. It was fantastic because the dog then comes directly at me. <laughs> so I get to get great photos like this. Likewise, in the next slide, um, this dog was way more interested in bringing the ball back than chasing it. Uh, we, we'd throw the ball, and, and sometimes she just didn't care. But when we would get her excited and anticipate that she would go after the ball, her running back with the ball was the really predictable movement. So that's, those are the photos that we captured. And in this one, I, I just waited for this dog to get bored of the ball, you know? It's, it's not even always about motion. It's just waiting for that behavior to, you know, we, we played fetch for a while. I did get some action photos, and eventually she just got really tired. So, you know, using the ball as, as, a, as a tool to, to get the dog tired enough that you can take some calmer and, and portrait-style photos. That's a really good strategy. Tire out your dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then, you know, I was talking a little bit about this earlier. Uh, this is all about that predictable behavior. These sled dogs are going in the exact same spot every time. And there's team after team. So I'm able to just sit there and just wait for moments like 
like this one to happen. You know, these, <laughs> this is one of my favorite photos I've taken. Uh, this was earlier this year. Um, and their tongues are just out of control. <laughs> I, shot, I shot, this is a, a sled dog race called the Fur Rondi, which happens the week before the Iditarod. Uh, it's a 26 mile sprint race through Anchorage. They actually close down streets and they put snow and a track on the streets and these dogs race through crowds of people and they repeat it three days in a row. So I get to sit there and take photos of 40 teams three days in a row. And I took photos of 40 teams three days in a row, but moments like this don't just happen. You know, I took probably 5,000 photos and this is my favorite one. That's amazing. That's just, well, that would, might be the, the equivalent of our Molson, um, um, the Indy, the Indy race in, right. in, in Canada here. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're doing this with dogs and the dogs there. So they're not all Huskies. They're different kinds of breeds of dogs or. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, there, this is a very different race than most sled dog races. Uh, these dogs are bred for speed more than anything else. They run 26 miles as fast as they can three days in a row. Um, some of the photos that you saw earlier of the sled dog teams, those were the more traditional Alaskan Huskies. And those dogs are built for endurance for the longer thousand mile Iditarod style races. Um, and they're also, they have warmer and thicker coats to handle more adverse weather and, and conditions and temperatures. So there's a whole, you know, as a state sport and as you would expect, there's a whole micro community of really specialized dogs that do this or that. But the one really common thing about these dogs is they all love to run. Like that's what they're really bred for more than anything else. The Alaskan Husky actually isn't a purebred breed. Um, you know, Siberian Husky is, is like most like a Dachshund or a Golden Retriever. It's a purebred dog, but Alaskan Huskies all look completely different. They're different shapes, different sizes, and they're bred for traits and characteristics. So they have all different kinds of dogs within them. I, I didn't know that. So what, so what is this um, breed of dog here that we're looking They would call this also an Alaskan Husky, all of these, uh, even though they all look extremely different from each other and different from the Iditarod dogs. But uh, in the community, they'd be referred to as sprint dogs. Beautiful dogs. <laughs> and so this is, uh, this is another kind of fun anecdote. Uh, Knowing your dog is, is super important. I watched this dog run several times and noticed that her gait was such that she does this. She, in, while running, she goes all points off. And when I noticed that, I had already gotten a bunch of really great action photos, right? But I noticed that she does that. So I just kept repeating and repeating until I got the all points off photo that I knew could happen. And some dogs don't run like that. And so... You don't sit around and shoot an extra 10 laps trying to capture a moment that's never going to happen. But if you don't know and study the subject, and again, you, you guys know how your dogs run much more than, than I ever will. So if you know that your dog levitates, then keep taking the photo so you get the levitation photo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this one. All right. Yes. So speaking of dogs. Yeah. So dogs in motion are definitely the hardest of everything that, that I do. It's, it's, technically difficult um you're balancing a lot of a lot of variables and a lot of things but like i said earlier the most important thing is to have predictable behavior um you want to shoot in bright light and the reason is because you're shooting at a very high shutter speed i don't want to bore people with the technical components but in general when we make a photo every photo is comprised of three technical components those are your shutter speed your aperture and your iso or your film speed um, the, the first one, shutter speed, is pretty easy to understand. It's how long is the shutter open and closed? How long are you letting light hit your sensor? Uh, the second one, aperture, is that hole we were talking about. The smaller the hole, the less light that's let in. The bigger the hole, the more light that's let in. And the effect of that on your photo is what's called depth of field, how much is in focus. The smaller the hole, more is in focus. The larger the hole, less is in focus. And more light is being let in. And uh, the last thing is ISO, and that's the one that you should think about least, but it's basically how sensitive is your sensor to light. If you're shooting in a very dark environment, you're going to have to have a very high ISO to capture the little tiny bit of light that exists, but as a result, you're going to have more noise in your image, and your image is going to be a lower quality. So you're always trying to keep your ISO low, but in reality, like that's not something that you should really think about because your cameras are all such high quality that they're, they're handling that for you. So the most important thing with dogs in motion is shutter speed. We're trying to freeze motion. If my shutter speed is too slow, 
I'm opening and closing the shutter at a rate in which the dog is blurry. It's moving too fast. And so as a general rule of thumb, I try and shoot at least one sixteen hundredth of a second. Uh, but going faster is, is definitely necessary based on the speed of the dog. Again, it's, it's knowing your dog. You know, sometimes I've got an older dog whose run is more of a trot. I can get away with a 500th or an 800th of a second. Um, and it, it's really just experiential learning, learning what you can, what you can get away with. And the best way to do that is to take photos at different shutter speeds and then go back and look at them. Mm-hmm. And think like, well, that dog was moving about that fast, and these were blurry, these were blurry, and this is where I managed to freeze the motion. So digital photography is great because we have that instant feedback loop. You know, I wouldn't have been able to become a photographer in the film days as quickly as I did because I couldn't afford the, the film for the amount of photos I would need to have taken to get where I did. But just by shooting a lot and reviewing your work and, and experimenting and learning from that, you'll, you'll figure out what's the right speed for your dog. But starting around 1600 is always a, a pretty good place. And then again, shoot with the sun at your back, illuminating the dog, and then shooting a high burst rate, which your phones can also do. Uh, you hold down the, the photo button and it'll just rapid fire off. And as you do that, you're also telling the camera that if you're taking rapid fire photos, then your subject's probably moving. So it's going to automatically increase the shutter speed for you. Um, and then know, knowing your equipment, you know, talking about is your camera good enough to capture dogs in motion with continuous autofocus and if not that manual focus trick that i talked about is amazing and something that i I still do from time to time even with my higher grade equipment just because it's a a fun way to shoot and maybe it's the right way to shoot in some situations Mm -hmm. let's look at some photos yeah so this is shot at one twenty five thousand twenty five hundredth 25 hundredths of a second these dogs are going 25 30 miles an hour and and I could have shot a little bit slower shutter speed here, and I probably would have frozen the dogs, but I wouldn't probably have frozen the tongues because they're all moving at different rates, you know? Uh, and so this was, this was shot at a lot higher shutter speed just so I could be sure to grab that tongue frozen in, in motion. Fantastic. I know. This, I, I got to go a little slower. I was watching the dog run and knew that he's fast, but he's not that fast. <laughs> so we, we brought it down to two thousandth of a second on this one. And then this next photo is uh, an even slower shutter speed because this is an older dog, shorter legs, doesn't run as fast. So I got away with one twelve fiftieth of a second here. Nice. Um, and this is one of my favorite things about dog photography that I've been talking about throughout the course of, of this. Um, in photography, if you're shooting weddings and the bride doesn't look beautiful, you screwed up. And if you go for a maternity shoot or a baby shoot and the baby isn't glowing, you screwed up. But you take these photos of dogs that look absolutely ridiculous and people love it. You know, that's why I can get away with shooting these fisheye photos of dogs where I distort their faces or I get extremely close and I'm just showing details. And you know, I can't take, you know, photos of somebody's nose and get them to pay me for it, but I can take a picture of your dog's nose. And you're going to love it. So here's some examples of, of photos that are not traditional portraits. You know, this is not this dog looking as pretty as this dog can be but I love this photo so much more than if I just posed and had him sitting there and and nicely, nicely composed in the photo. I'm getting close and this dog's tongue dominates the face. Like, why would I not capture that? It's just goofy gorgeous. (laughs) (laughs) So much fun. Uh, And then here's a, a couple other, you know, the dogs on the left. I have great portraits of these dogs. They're sitting very nicely. They're pretty well trained uh, German short hair pointers that are hunting dogs, but it's so much funnier to have them this goofy wide eyed wonder and as they're exploding forward to chase a, a rope toy, I think. And on the right here, are these two, again, I have some nice portraits of the dogs both smiling, but they look so much cooler with the wind blowing and that one on the right can only can see one eye. It's just, there's so much uh, attitude and, and character in that photo versus the, the nicer and more traditional portraits I took of these dogs. Yeah, and, and you're getting them in their natural setting and their personalities are coming through. Like, how am I dealing with this wind? <laughs> yeah, love it. You're really good at taking fun. Tongue photography. Dog tongue Well, I mean, photography. the dogs make it super easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things that I think, you know, maybe that you, you, you're you drawn to looking at because when you watch a dog run, there's so much going on. But when you freeze that moment, the tongue becomes so obvious. Right. So great. Yeah. And just some more 
ridiculous, ridiculous <laughs> dog faces. Again, I have very nice portraits of both of these dogs, but the owners definitely liked these photos more. Fun. They're fun. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess now we can talk a little bit about resources, like where did I learn and where can you guys learn more? Um, and the absolute best way is Instagram, in my opinion. Find some people who take photos you like and then reverse engineer them. Figure out what it is about that photo you like, how it is they took that photo, and how can you recreate photos like that. That has been my number one resource and learning tool through my photography journey. Uh, Facebook is actually a surprisingly good place too. There are like these groups, um, like photography enthusiast groups. Uh, they can be local, regional, you know, like Ohio or Cleveland based photographers. Um, they can be dog specific. Uh, they can be camera specific. Uh, you know, there's, there's enthusiast groups for your specific model of Nikon or this specific lens and spend some time in there. And there's just going to be people posting photos and talking about how they made them or giving you the opportunity to ask questions. So that's a, a fantastic resource. YouTube is both great and terrible. Um, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. There are a lot of great people teaching photography for free on YouTube. It's an easy resource. Unfortunately, the reality that I found was that most of the people that are teaching on YouTube do so because they can't make a living taking photos. They're not great at photography. Um, and so as a result, I found that there's a margin of diminishing returns on YouTube tutorials. Uh, you can learn a lot upfront, learn the basics, um, but the more time you spend, the less you'll glean from each lesson. You know, you'll watch an hour long lesson and maybe you'll only learn five or 10 seconds of new information but you don't know where that is. So you have to watch the whole thing anyway. So I would say like YouTube is a great place definitely to start learning. Um, but as you get better experience is so much more valuable than time spent at your computer. And then lastly, professionals, um, find professionals in the area. They don't have to be dog photographers to help you. If you want to take dog photos, you can still learn other types of photography and translate those skills back to dogs. Um, I, I teach, um, have a number of students that, that I work with, and we do a variety of things from, from dog photos to wildlife, landscape, you know, uh, astrophotography. So uh, yeah, professionals can be a great resource because it's, it's great to be able to go out with someone and have them kind of help or guide or, or walk you through photos. And then immediately afterwards, I'm a big fan of always going to a coffee shop or, or somewhere and sitting down and reviewing the images and talking about what worked and what didn't work and how you can improve upon them in the future. That's nice. Like tapping into a community of like-minded people who are phot photographing similar things. And then you learn from somebody that's a little bit more advanced from you. And then eventually it will happen. You'll mentor somebody. And yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier. I, uh, I started doing this really fun um, kind of photo competition a number of years ago. Um, I call it a, a shot and a beer. And uh, what we do is I have a number of friends who are professionals or just amateurs, hobbyists, enthusiasts, and we all meet up at a bar. And uh, in advance, we have selected a, a judge, one of our friends. And we've told our judge, we're going to meet at this bar in downtown Anchorage, or we're going to meet at this bar in, or this brewery in Denver or wherever we are. And in advance, the judge has come up with a secret theme. So we all show up to the bar, we all order a beer, we call our friend and they tell us the theme, whatever it is, and then finish our beer and we all have one hour and on foot, we explore the neighborhood shooting along that theme and we'll meet back and kind of talk about how it went and go home and pick our favorite three or five photos and send them off to the judge anonymous, anonymously and like pick our winners. And, and it's such a fun thing for so many reasons. It gets me out of my comfort zone. It, uh, it really challenges me and like it excites me when five other people are in the exact same place at the exact same time as me and manage to take completely different photos. You know, you can learn so much from different ways that other people see the same things as you. So I would strongly recommend folks do something like that because it's just a really, really fun time. The themes we've had are like framed through the looking glass, um, emotion in motion, you know, they can be really esoteric things, green, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be something hoity toity. Uh, to, to get you thinking a little bit differently. And it's just a fun way to, to focus your artistic creativity. Those are great ideas. And so what, what inspires you in the work that you do? The dogs, mostly. I mean, <laughs> if I'm being <laughs> honest. Yeah. Where do you draw from your inspiration? Um, all over the place. Uh, like as I mentioned earlier, I'm a climber and a skier. Um, and I do shoot some climbing and ski photography as well. Um, 
my my biggest photographic inspiration is a guy that I got I was lucky enough to work with as a professional adventure photographer named Forrest Woodward is just a phenomenal phenomenal photographer and infuriating to work with because he's just so good he doesn't understand the technical components of his camera he just sees the world a little bit differently and a little a little uniquely so I, I was doing some climbing work out at Devil's Tower a few years back and before I had a camera or purchased a camera and um, he he was the photographer on the project and I started following his work and I think that that's like the first big trigger for me into what photography can be and the way that you can see the world um, and he continues to be a huge inspiration even though he hasn't ever shot a photo of a dog uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum is this guy named Alex Hopes. He is a dog photographer down in Austin, Texas, runs a, a company called Zilker Bark. And he's a guy that I look to for dog photo related inspiration. This guy is so fun and creative. He runs like three or four different Instagram accounts and just has an amazing amount of dog photography output. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of him and would strongly recommend, uh, recommend folks check him out. And if you're in the Austin area and need a good dog photographer, check out Alex. Uh, and then the, the last three are all adventure, climbing, or ski photographers. Um, that's how I spend a lot of my free time is climbing and skiing. And so um, just finding new ways to to see and represent those things has been always a, a lot of fun. Folks will maybe recognize Jimmy Chin's name. Uh, he just won the Oscar for uh, Best Documentary for that crazy movie Free Solo about uh, the free soloist Alex Honnold. So it was Jimmy Chin and his wife who uh, were the spirit who directed and, and made that movie, and he was the principal photographer on on that. He also, folks probably remember from Meru, another film that came out a number of years back. That's it's about him, but he also shot. Great, great idea. So basically, what you're, um, you know, you, you're inspired by people that are not just dog photographers, and so you're encouraging people to just like follow what it is that you're passionate about. Yeah, and absolutely. Find inspiration there. Yeah, I mean, like, one easy thing, like, if you like portraits of people, like, follow, like, e even, if, even if you don't, like, I'm not super passionate about portraits of people, but I follow a lot of really great portrait artists on Instagram because reverse engineering the things that they're doing to make those photos so cool are things that I can apply to dogs. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm curious um, about what is your favorite experience um, doing dog photography? Like? I've had a lot of really cool experiences. Uh, super lucky. You know, shooting sled dogs has been amazing. Um, I still am super excited about photographing my own dogs. You know, they're, they're always there and it's always a fun, creative challenge to try and find new ways to, to show them off. They each have their own Instagram accounts. Uh, but if I had to like pick a single one, uh, when I first moved to Alaska a few years ago, I was lucky enough to get hired by this couple to do a dog shoot. And they live in the, in Palmer, based of these mountains, uh, and suggested that after I came over to the house, we go and uh, shoot some photos of the dog skiing. And I got there, and they have a nine-month-old and a two- or three-year-old kid. And we, we take some photos around the house, and then we head out, and she puts the nine-month-old in a backpack, and he hauls a sled with the, the other kid and then they have two dogs, the other ones ahead of me in these photos, but we went skiing and they brought these little kids and their dogs to the top of this mountain and guy, the dad took the sled away and the kid had his skis and he put them on and then mom is telemark skiing down with this nine month old in her backpack and the dogs are just weaving in and out of everybody and it was just a very cool and surreal experience. And uh, maybe realize made me realize pretty quickly how out of my league I am in terms of adventure enthusiasts in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Were you on skis as well? Yeah, I was. Yeah, you're on skis. Yeah, there's no way we could have taken any of these photos <laughs> from that day if, if I wasn't skiing along with them. But they're much better skiers than I am. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite my favorite shoots I've gotten. You know, my my shoots usually last an hour. I spent six hours with these guys. You know. I'm not charging any extra. I get to go skiing and I get to take images like this. Like it's just too much fun. Have you ever had an experience where you didn't get along with your subject? I have had one. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell two quick stories. Um, no is the short answer. Uh, but the long answer is um, I did a shoot with a pair of dogs and they seemed completely normal and we got there and was taking photos and one dog would not stop barking at me and really just seemed to dislike me. And the owners were super caught off guard because that was not normal behavior for that dog. And 
I just started trying things and I turned off the shutter noise on my camera, dog went completely normal. It just didn't like the click click of the shutter. And so that was just like a weird learning experience for me to, to remember that there are, I'm introducing a lot of foreign things into a dog's world, cameras and, and myself, mm -hmm. maybe the behavior I'm trying to elicit to, to capture photos. And so just made me think a little bit more cognizantly as, as I approach dogs in the future. Uh, and then the second one was uh, a dog uh, who's actually a friend's dog and was really severely abused uh, before she was rescued. And as a result, you know, they've, they've changed their whole life. The, the dog is very wonderful at home, but can't, it's just extremely territorial. And they can't have friends over for dinner anymore. They can't have house, house guests. They've just committed to living their life around, you know, helping this dog. And they want photos. And so we brought the dog to a dog park when we knew there'd be nobody there. And the dog obviously like ran up to me and was very angry. Um, but the, the, I like stayed out of it and just kind of ignored and watched the dog and the owners interact and quickly learned that like for this dog ball is life. So we slowly transitioned from the owners throwing the ball to me throwing the ball and dog brings the ball back, drops it, doesn't like me, but wants me to throw the ball again. And so for an hour we communed over this, this ball and I got all the photos I needed and wanted while giving the dog a lot of space and respect, but also being able to elicit the, the behavior I wanted to capture on camera. Good for you. You, you work with the dog. You work with yeah. what the dog needs. You, it's all about that. Yeah. It's all about the dog. And so if you, had, if you had your dream dog photography project, what would that look like? Uh, okay, so there's this, there's this uh, thousand mile race across Alaska called the Iditarod. Uh, people might have heard of like Balto, a uh, famous Alaskan sled dog was part of the first team that ran this race. And uh, it's a huge thing in Alaska. It happens every year. And it goes through entirely like undeveloped trackless wilderness. It passes through several villages. The villages are ac accessible by dog sled, plane, snowmobile. And that's it. There's no roads where these guys are going. And so being able to follow the race from start to completion would just be an absolute dream for me. Last year, I was super lucky. I have a buddy with a bush plane and he flew me out. So I shot the start in Anchorage and then they, they go up about an hour north of Anchorage for the restart. They have a ceremonial start through the city. It's super fun. And then we go an hour north and they actually take off. And so I'm out there on a frozen lake taking pictures of dogs, having a great time. And the next day, my buddy took the day off work and flew me in his ski plane out to the first checkpoint, which is like 120 miles along the trail. And as we're in the air, he let me open the, the plane door and shoot straight down on dog teams like this. Uh, and then we got there and I got to take pictures of all the dogs coming into the checkpoint out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and to be able to extrapolate that, not just on day one, but through the, the course of the whole race would be an absolute dream. Fantastic. Would you want to be on a sled? Would you want to have that? Kind oh, of man, if I could be on a sled, that would be even better. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I think that's a little too much for me to ask, though. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know what can happen. Yeah. Wow. Well, I look forward to hearing more about your adventures with, um, with your dog projects. Um, I'm going to take you down. Yeah. So yeah, these are, these are my dogs. Thank you. Thanks everybody for, for following along. I hope you guys learned something and, and more than that, I hope you're inspired to get out and maybe take some, some photos of your dogs and, and show them off in a bit of a new and unique way. Um, these are my dogs. Uh, big dumb guy on the left is Vita Vu and the big small little dumb guy on the right is, is Tux. <laughs> As you can see, the, the derpiest of derpy dogs. I love them dearly. <laughs> and for anybody, uh, this last slide, if anybody uh, has any additional questions, please feel free to, to contact me. I love nerding out on photography. You just want to send me dog photos, that'd make me very happy. <laughs> I'm all about unsolicited dog photos. I'm based in Anchorage. Uh, if you or know anybody in the area or live up there that, that wants a dog photo shoot, please reach out. And I do travel nationally. Um, you know, I'll go to Denver or to, to Boston or Dallas and book a week or two of shoots while I'm there. So um, just because you're not in the Alaska area, if you are interested in dog photos, please reach out. I'll put you on my, my notification list for when I, I'm in your area. And also, if you're interested in additional instruction, I do offer private instruction, both local and remote. Um, so love to help people take better photos of their dogs or just take better photos in general. Lots of fun. And I'm definitely going to follow you on Instagram. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, that. thank you.
thanks so much for joining us today and educating us about how to photo photograph our dogs. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in to Dog Care on Air and have a great day. Thank you, Ella.